All right. Okay, and, and thanks you all for joining us tonight. Uh, Seth Thompson, who's a, a wildlife biologist with now, it, it's called the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. There's been a name change since he spoke with us last. He joined us right after Memorial Day, you may remember, for those who tuned in, and he spoke about human and bear interactions, and he made the offer to come back and talk about black bear biology. And we, uh, we jumped on that pretty quick, and we invited him back, and he was gracious enough to return. So, uh, so Seth, thank you again for joining us, and uh, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Well, thanks, Phil, and, and uh, thank you, everybody, for having me and, and for turning out to, to listen. Um, as Phil said, last time we talked more about conflicts and, and problems with bears and how to prevent those problems at home. Uh, but tonight, I, I really wanted to talk about biology and bear behavior. Um, they're just a fascinating animal. So any, any opportunity I get to talk about bears, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. But I find that, you know, a lot of us know something about bears. We've got experience with bears maybe at our home. Uh, we've been to the Knoxville Zoo. Maybe we've seen them down in Cades Cove or something like that. So everybody has seen on TV documentaries, things like that to sort of know a little bit about bears, but I find there's an awful lot of uh, misinformation out there. People have certain beliefs that they think about bears that really are not true. So I really, I'm so thank you for having me back. I love to talk about the species and, and my goal here tonight is to really, is that everybody in the audience will learn something new that they didn't already know about bears. Um, and I find the more people know about this animal, the less scary they are, the more willing they are to maybe change their behavior to accommodate bears and, and tolerate them on the landscape. And, and uh, so let's get into it here. Um, so the species we have, you know, the, the genus and species is Ursus americanus, and that's just the, the American black bear, but black bears or the species actually come in multiple color phases. Uh, a lot of folks don't know that. This little guy up in the top left, the cinnamon bear, that's just a cinnamon color phase of an American black bear. It's the exact same species we have here in Virginia and in southeastern Kentucky, uh, but just a different color phase. And they, they typically, you see those out in the Intermountain West, more, more dry or arid environments. And then the, in the, the bottom left corner, you've got kind of a blonde and, and brownish color phase. Those are definitely American black bears, the exact same species, and a lot of folks will confuse those with grizzly bears where they uh, coexist out, you know, in the northern Rockies, but those are definitely American black bears, the same, same critter we have, just a different color. Uh, then down in the bottom right, we've got kind of a bluish slate color bear, and those are on the Pacific, in the Pacific Northwest, Alaska, British Columbia, a uh, really neat color. And then, of course, uh, off the coast of British Columbia, there's an island called Kermode Island. And uh, there they have this almost completely white bear, uh, spirit bear, as the, the, Native Ameri the natives there uh, call them. Uh, but you've got this, this temperate rainforest, very green, very verdant place. And then you have this really stark white bear. So it's really a neat contrast. But these are all the same species that we have here. Uh, they're, you know, brown, so there's the brown bear, like a coastal brown bear, which is actually a, the same species as grizzly bears, but then we have color phases of uh, the Ursus americanus, the American black bear. So um, black bears, they really evolved in the forest. They're a, they're a forest dwelling creature, and so when you look at their claws down here in the bottom right, they're short, and they're really curved, and that's absolutely for climbing trees. Uh, whenever a black bear feels threatened, they tend to climb a tree to escape from, from threats. That's their number one uh, way of dealing with threats. Uh, and they also will forage up in a tree. They'll go up there to eat apples, they'll go up there to eat other fruits or, or nuts, you know, acorns, hard mass, that type of stuff. Uh, so they do spend a lot of time in trees, and that's why they have these little short claws. They also use those claws to dig up insects. Uh, insects, especially right now, July and August, are really um, a major food source for them. So digging up logs and uh, under rocks and things is, is a, a major use for those little claws. And for defense, you know, anytime they get in a tussle with another bear, 
Um, they're going to use those claws. And then to some degree, marking territory. Uh, whenever, every time we see uh, claw marks on a tree, a lot of times that's just where the bear's trying to climb the tree. But they do tend to mark their territory, at least adult males uh, do every now and then. But I, I put up in the top right uh, a, an inset picture here of a grizzly bear's claws. And those are actually fairly short and worn down for a grizzly bear. But just to show you the difference, they're, they're extremely long and, and they're much straighter than that of the, of the black bear. And a grizzly bear, they really evolved out in open country. They like tundra, they like the plains. Uh, there used to be grizzly bears way out in, in Nebraska, Kansas, the Dakotas. Um, but they like to dig and that's also why grizzly bears have that big hump over their shoulder. Uh, it, that's all muscle to help them dig. They dig up roots and tubers like from the carrot family, uh, lamation family. Um, digging up uh, ground squirrel nests and caches and so on. They, they like to dig. They're like a badger. They're a big badger basically in the bear, in the bear world. Uh, but black bears, little short claws to climb with. Uh, and, and also I should probably point out that there's a big difference there evolutionary wise with respect to their uh, perceived threats and how they, they their, uh, their, their temperament. Black bears are, are really shy. They're way more passive. They will run for cover or climb up a tree because they, had, they evolved in the forest so they've got a lot more cover and trees to climb. But a grizzly bear, you know, we, we hear about grizzly bears being more aggressive and more defensive of their young or a food source. And that's because they evolved out in the open, out in the prairie, out in the tundra where there were no trees or very little cover. So they have a much, much bigger uh, personal space, I guess you could say, that they will defend. And if, if you or a perceived threat enters that, that's why a grizzly bear is much more likely to be defensive and to attack as opposed to a black bear. So that's a, a key difference in their evolution and how they evolved in terms of dealing with threats. As far as senses go, you know, they, we are pretty sure they see pretty much about how we do. They do see in color and in terms of the distance and, and um, being able to see as much like that of humans. And of course their, their vision and their being able to see Color helps them distinguish berries that are ripe from one another or different insects or things that they might want to eat. Uh, their smell is unheard of. They can smell seven times that of a bloodhound. So they really have a tremendous, tremendous uh, sense of smell. And they have in their, up in their rostrum, which is sort of their nasal region, Bomer nasal region, the Jacobson's organ. And that Jacobson's organ is what really amplifies their ability to smell. So when a bear is kind of kind of opening its mouth and trying to smell and, and get a better sense of things, it's, it's almost like it's trying to taste. It's trying to get all that air into that Jacobson's organ to sort of amplify their smell. And for those of you that have livestock, you've had a bull or a, a stallion around during the breeding time, and they do the Fleming response where they curl up their nose when they're trying to detect if a female is in heat or not. The bull or the stallion in that case are doing the same thing. They're trying to draw all that air into their uh, Jacobson's organ to help amplify the smell. And that's what, that's the key of why bears can smell for so far and so well is that organ. And their hearing is roughly that of, of people. And I, I put this picture here, I, I, you know, a lot of folks I, I get calls about, well, the bear stood up on me. Uh, and really, when a bear stands up, they're just trying to get a better, a better view of you and, and assess whether you are a threat or not. And also, they might catch a, a better sense of smell with the air blowing by. So that's just a curious bear trying to size you up. That's not an aggressive stance in, in any way, shape, or form. But a lot of folks think when a bear stands up like that, they're about to attack and come at you. And that's not the case at all. Uh, Bears are solitary for most of the time, except of course for the breeding season and then any, any females with dependent young. It's uh, on occasion when, when uh, cubs are weaned as yearlings, sometimes they'll stay together for quite some time. It's kind of like uh, strength in numbers or like a little gang to just try to help uh, protect one another. Uh, very intelligent animal, inquisitive. They're very curious, um, almost problem solving. Uh, they really are an intelligent animal. And they're mostly active at, at dawn and dusk. 
uh, but they can be active any time of day. I have people call me and say, hey, that bear was out during the middle of the day. There's, you know, there's something wrong with it. And that's not the case at all. Anytime a bear uh, feels like it wants to get up and, and move around, they do. Uh, I was at the Wise County Landfill, uh, it was last week, and it was probably 85 degrees, 1230 in the afternoon, and there was a bear just walking, walking down the road, panting just like a dog, you know, bright, bright daylight, really hot, um, and there he was out, out moving around. It is true that they tend to be more active at night this time of year because it's just so hot. They, they sleep during the day and then are active more at night, but that's more of a seasonal thing. They, they can really be active anytime. And of course, bears are omnivorous, meaning they eat just about anything and they're very opportunistic about that. And we'll talk about why that is, but they really focus on available foods that are high, high calorie foods. I'm afraid to go outside. That's something I hear all the time. A lot of folks feel like they're prisoners in their own home because they're just terrified of bears. And so that's why I always love to try to give talks like this um, to try to calm folks down and realize that bears are not out to get them. But I have to pick on my, my taxidermist friends who, who, you know, mount all these bears with teeth open and, ah, you know, claws out and all that. But it really is misconstrues bears completely, black bears especially, they are not out to get you. They really just just want to eat and just keep going and want nothing to do with people. They're generally a very shy animal and they're very passive. They, they really don't want to waste calories or do anything risky uh, unless they absolutely have to. So a lot of folks of course are, are afraid of being attacked by bears. Uh, and hopefully, as I, I mentioned about how they evolved and their, their sort of temperament, you know, black bears, their first instinct is to run away. They're very passive. But of course, occasionally people do get injured by bears, uh, even killed by black bears, that is. Um, but for every one person that is killed by a black bear in all of North America, so that includes Canada and Mexico where there are black bears, 60 are killed by domestic dogs, 180 by bees, 350 by lightning and 90,000 by other people. So statistically speaking, your chances of getting attacked or even killed by a bear are extremely low. Uh, and I think we have over 8 million people in the state of Virginia. I'm not sure what the, the Kentucky population is. It's probably a little less than, than 8 million in Virginia, but um, quite a few bears. We've got probably anywhere from 15 to 20,000 black bears, we guess, in the state of Virginia. And you'd think if they were out to get us, people would be getting hurt left and right all the time, but it just, it's very, very rare. Uh, true or false, one of the most dangerous encounters is getting between a mother black bear and her cubs. It's actually false. A lot of folks believe that, that certain death will occur if you get between a black uh, bear mother and her cubs or get anywhere near them. Um, and it's true that a female black bear can be a little more dangerous the most dangerous black bear really is a predatory black bear, an animal that, that just sees a person as a food source, but that is extremely, extremely rare. That's extremely rare. Um, but it's, it's very unlikely if you encounter a, a female black bear, most likely what she's gonna do is she's gonna make a noise that we cannot hear, but her cubs can. And those cubs are gonna run up a tree and she's either gonna sit at the bottom of the tree or she's gonna move off and, and move away until you pass. And then once you've passed or she feels comfortable that the threat is gone, she'll come back and she'll call her cubs down and off they go. A few years ago uh, here in Wise County, I had a guy call me and he was absolutely freaked out and frantic and I could hear his wife screaming in the background. And they had a female with little cubs like this come in their yard and their dogs went out to to go after this bear. So I told him, just calm down, just call your dogs back in. Do not go out and try to break up the fight. Just call your dogs back and just get quiet and they'll go away. And that's exactly what they did. They were able to get their dogs in. Maybe 20, 30 minutes later, the female got her cubs down out of the tree and off they went, never had a problem again. But if you do see a, a female with cubs, it's best to give them some space be quiet, just kind of slowly retreat and go hike somewhere else or go do something else or just go, um, just try to not do anything that's threatening at all. 
Um, we, we've just had very few people ever get attacked or injured by a female black bear. Uh, we've got a lot of bears in the state. What do bears eat? Well, about 75% of their diet here in Virginia is plant-based. Berries, nuts, grasses, sedges, uh, different fruits, acorns, it, you name it. A lot of folks are surprised to hear that. A lot of, a lot of them think that bears are predators and they are, you know, they're just not an obligatory predator like a, a coyote or a wolf or a mountain lion for that matter. They, they're not, they, they're omnivores, as we mentioned before, they'll eat just about anything. They, they can and do kill fawns, kill adult deer occasionally, uh, rodents, um, fish, if they can get them, they can't really, it's hard for them to get or access any fish here in, in this part of the world. Um, insects are a huge uh, part of their diet, especially this time of year. Uh, the larva, especially, Carrion, if they find a roadkill or, or, or a dead animal out in the woods, they'll, they'll feed on. But to take down a, uh, an adult deer or a calf, you know, a lot of folks are afraid about their livestock, um, is really a risky thing. You can get kicked in the face, you can get gored by an antler, you can really get injured, and there's a lot of risk associated with that, and uh, maybe not worth the, the return on the investment for a bear. So bears have to do that. They have to think about you know, how risky is this and what's the, the calorie food reward uh, when they eat. So they generally are not predators. They do and can take down animals, um, but it's pretty rare. Grizzly bears a little bit more. They'll take down more, um, you know, more mammals uh, than, than black bears do. So we talked about uh, acorns and hard mast, and that's a really important food source in the fall for bears because typically and it, it starts happening with the changing in the daylight. Uh, when, the, when the days become shorter, that triggers in the bear uh, a metabolic state called hyperphagia, and hyperphagia means they just eat, eat, eat as much as they possibly can. They spend most of their time of the day eating as much as they can. So they really focus again on those really high calorie foods, acorns, other things that they can get, especially in the fall when that, those shorter days start to, to come on. Um, berries, anything like that that's really high calorie. Uh, over the winter, the bear may lose 30% of their, their body weight. So that's why they gotta pack on all that extra food. It's basically just a, a way for the bear to deal with the lack of food on the landscape in the winter. Uh, especially when you're a, a you know, 75% of your diet is plant-based, you really got to get it, you know, put on all the weight you can before those plants go dormant and the fruits are gone uh, or nuts. So that's why bears do that. And that hyperphagia helps them do that. It just makes them eat, eat, eat. And that coincides with when acorns come on. So all that stuff is really important. Hickory nuts, beech nuts, acorns, all that's really uh, crucial food sources for bears. And, and those, as many of you know, is really um, variable. Some years we have lots and lots of, of acorns and, and beech nuts and so on, and some years we don't. Uh, and some of you are involved with and know about the American chestnut. Uh, the American chestnut was, you know, produces a very large nut full of protein and fat that weren't really variable. It was a very consistent producer of a very valuable food source for bears, deer, a lot of other species. And now that the American chestnut is gone, bears really have to focus on other things. And so um, that was a big loss for a lot of wildlife species when we lost uh, American chestnuts. And so another thing to, to think about with that variation in the food sources in the fall, you know, when there's really a bad uh, hard mass crop, we don't have any acorns, and let's say we didn't have any berries either, bears really have a hard time surviving. They just don't put on enough fat. Uh, they, they travel more, they have to cover more land to, to get the nutrients they need, and that puts them, they've got to cross roads and maybe get hit by a car. They've got to go to new areas where that, that they don't know, they're not familiar with. Uh, other bears might kill them. Uh, they might run into people in areas and other risks that, that uh, impact their survival. So this is interesting. This is another thing that, that people um, 
don't realize sometimes, but ant nests produce formic acid. And formic acid, when it breaks down, uh, or yeah, formic acid, and but when, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. The uh, insulation in houses, in ATV seeds, any kind of styrofoam material, when that stuff breaks down, the formaldehyde in that breaks down into formic acid, just like an ant nest. So a lot of times bears will break into stuff and cause tremendous property damage. And for those of you that were here um, for the talk before, you heard of the story about how bears will tear into houses, um, chew up hot tub covers and all kinds of weird stuff because they smell that formic acid in the insulation and they swear they just are convinced that there is an ant nest in there, uh, but there's not. And so they do this tremendous property damage um, occasionally. So just kind of an interesting thing. It's a hard thing for me to respond to and um, to deal with. So home ranges, males can have a home range of 10 to 300 square miles. So just enormous, you know, just a huge territory to cover. Uh, females anywhere from one to 50 square miles. So significantly less. Uh, these locations on the screen here, that's from a, a collared female from, I think back, well, it looks like uh, 2010, so before my time. Uh, but this female was wearing a GPS collar and this is just sort of her movements. This is a female that lived in Wise County. Uh, it looks like she denned up right here and spent a lot of time on this side of the mountain. It looks like maybe came down through this way. I don't, I don't know where this is exactly. I'm guessing the Guest River, upper part of the Guest River maybe. Uh, and then she went to a mine dumpster over here at a mine portal <laughs> and spent a lot of time over here. But what happens is, is that, you know, the year we talked about uh, variation in the food resources, when we have a really good acorn crop, a really good berry crop, and we have lush uh, natural foods, bears don't have to travel. So their home range is much, much smaller. Uh, but in bad natural food years, bears have to expand. They have to cover more territory to try to find the, the resources that they need. And as I mentioned, that really puts them in uh, conflict with people and potentially uh, survival is, is impacted. <clears throat> uh, hibernation. Bears are not true hibernators, and I'll, I'll make the distinction. Uh, a hibernator is like a ground squirrel or a woodchuck or, or a whistle pig, as my papa used to call them. Uh, a true hibernator reduces their body temperature to just above freezing. And they, their heartbeat, let's say a ground squirrel might have a 200 heartbeats per minute. That'll go down to just one or two beats per minute, just enough to push enough blood and oxygen to oxygenate the body and the, um, the organs. And that's it. Uh, their respiration rate, maybe one breath, just, just barely enough to just keep them alive as they drop their body temperature and all those metabolic rates decrease. The hibernator also, the ground squirrel, the whistle pig, in their dens they'll also cache food. They'll be collecting grains and nuts and different things and grasses and put them in a little chamber in their den. Every now and then they'll kind of wake up, they'll go, they'll eat. They may even go out of their den to urinate and defecate. Now the bear does none of those things. The bear does not eat or drink or urinate or defecate for months and somehow are able to live with that. Like for us, if we didn't eliminate uh, waste from our bodies, it would be extremely toxic uh, and it would kill us or it would kill the true hibernator. But the bear somehow has evolved a way to not have to do that. They don't have to drink or eat or urinate or defecate. And it's really amazing how they're able to withstand all that. And they build up all of that fat uh, and a lot of folks are, gosh, like, how do they, how do they put on all that weight so quickly and not have metabolic disorders like, like we do, uh, diabetes, different, different problems, heart problems, uh, and they don't, they don't have those issues. So there's a lot of really cool uh, research being done, especially at, at uh, Washington State University in Pullman, Washington. They do, they have a lot of captive bears, and they do a lot of research about metabolism, and there's some really cool uh, medical research that's being done on bears that hopefully can help treat people with metabolic disorders or heart conditions and so on. So it's really, it's really neat. 
but the bear just barely drops their body temperature, you know, nine to 14 degrees or so. Um, their heart rate and respiration rates will go down, but not nearly bottom out like a true hibernator. And they can be aroused. You, you can wake a bear up. They can come out of their den. Um, and occasionally bears do come out of their den. And if there's not any food around or anything for them to eat, they'll go back down into their den and, and continue to, to den up and sleep. They may lose up to 30% of their body weight. So they really shrink and, and just work off of that, survive off of the, the body fat that they've been able to put on. And of course the female bears give birth and produce milk while they're, they're basically asleep. So typically uh, bears enter their den sometime in October. And usually the first uh, bears to go in a den is usually a female that is pregnant, that's gonna have cubs over the winter. So she's usually the first one to go in, followed by a female who has little cubs of the year. And then younger bears and adult males, they're usually the last to go in, sometimes December or January before they make it into their den. Uh, in Virginia, most of our bears den in the ground, uh, rock cavities, they'll dig out. Uh, I've seen a lot of them, like when a, a big hemlock on a north facing slope, for example, falls over and there's sort of a, underneath the root wad, there's usually a good protected place. That's a real popular place for a bear to den up. Uh, but we have lots of rock cavities, uh, Pine Mountain, there's all kinds of, of little place, nooks and crannies for a bear to go. Brush piles, trees, we've had bears den up in trees uh, before. Um, mines, we've had them get into mine portals, uh, you name it. And so it typically, especially in states like Louisiana, Mississippi, down in swampy kind of country, bears will den up in trees almost exclusively to stay away from rising water and, and to not drown, basically. So that's, that's really common uh, in the Mississippi Delta, the, the bear population there. Reproduction, so typically females will come into heat their first time as a three-year-old, sometimes or four-year-old, uh, and they reproduce every two years, so she'll, she'll come into heat, she'll be bred by the male. And then the eggs, this is another interesting thing that's unique to bears is that the delayed implantation. So once she's bred, let's say in June is typically when bears breed, June, July, um, she'll be bred and she could be bred by multiple males and could have uh, eggs fertilized in one litter by, by different male bears. Uh, but those eggs that are, are fertilized will basically float around in her uterus until much later, typically November or December. So by December, she will have gone through the, the natural food year. So if she had a really good year, she had a lot of berries, got to eat lots of acorns and she's in really good body condition, then more of those eggs are gonna implant in the uterus and start to develop because she's in the body condition that she can not only support herself, but she can um, grow these cubs and have lots of milk and produce milk for them. Let's say she, she's bred and she's got a couple of eggs that are fertilized in there, but there's, it's really a drought year. We didn't have much for berries. Let's say we didn't have any acorns and she's not really in very good body condition. Well, those few, if any of those eggs at that point in December would actually implant and begin to develop. So it's sort of like a, an insurance, survival insurance policy for the female bear based on her body condition, knowing that she feeds on a lot of different um, a lot of variating uh, food sources. So it's a really interesting thing, the delayed implantation. Uh, those cubs are then, once they, those um, eggs implant in the uterus in December, by mid to late January, they will, the cubs will be born and they'll be little pinkies, kind of like the lower left, that's a one day old, He's dead, his eyes are not open or hers and doesn't have a whole lot of hair. Um, so they're, they're sort of basic little, little bear cubs at that point but they continue to grow and develop. Uh, the female's uh, milk is very rich in, in fat and protein, so they grow very quickly. Uh, we see typically two, and a, two to two and a half, but I've seen as many as four. Um, Jeremy, you've seen a female who has who had several litters of five, if I'm not mistaken. She was the fertile myrtle at Kingdom Come State Park, uh, but they're blind and helpless. And they stay with their mom once they grow up and they, they emerge from their dens, typically May. You know, usually late April and May is when a female will emerge with little cubs of the year. 
uh, but they once they um, are born and everything, they will stay with their mother for 15 months. So they're born in January all the way around until she comes into heat typically then the following year as yearlings, then they'll get kicked off. So Virginia, this is not the case in Kentucky, but Virginia is absolutely bear country. We have fantastic bear habitat in this state. Um, all over the state, the only county in Virginia that we've not had a verified sighting is Northampton, out here on the, the southern tip of the Delmarva Peninsula, uh, north of Virginia Beach. That's the only county. Every, every other county we've had uh, verified sightings. The green area is, we've got a, a reproducing population in all those areas. Uh, but the, you know, the, the yellow counties are, are typically males that are just out wandering around, um, but we, we haven't verified any breeding in those areas. So we live in bear country for sure. Uh, human bear problems, uh, we, we touched base with this before. Um, garbage is the number one thing that I have to deal with. Um, pet food, bird feeders, uh, beehives. Uh, we don't have as much agriculture down here, but we do have quite a bit of corn and stuff and maybe some apples here and there. Corn mostly in Scott and um, Lee County, uh, but a lot of apple producers and different things that we have to, to issue kill permits for. But garbage is the biggie. We just preach the gospel of removing all that stuff. Anything that you can remove or secure, you can put up electric fencing, you can use bear-proof garbage cans, you can use different scare devices and things, but we really try to prevent problems to begin with, as we talked about in the last talk. But now that you know, you know, a, a year in the life of a bear, they've got basically about six to eight, maybe 10 months of the year to forage to sustain them for 12. So that really puts into focus why they need the calories that they do. And when you look at this list over here, the things that we have around our houses or that we throw away, you know, a uh, 25 pound bag of Purina dog chow has 42,425 calories. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. And that can be a major difference between life and death in a bear. So you can see why they would be tempted to come around our homes and businesses, especially in a bad natural food year to try to get calories that they need to survive, uh, let alone to reproduce. Um, chocolate chip cookies, a one pound bag is 3,200 calories. So, you know, we, the things that we eat are absolutely of value to a bear. And once they lose their fear and start dumpster diving or looking for dog food and things that they, it's almost like meth for bears. They, uh, they just can't help it. And they, they tend to, to gravitate that direction to where that's all they forage on is garbage. So that's why we always get back to, to the prevention of things. Uh, and I mentioned to y'all before that Clark's Welding in Appalachia is doing a fantastic job making uh, these, welding these, these lids and retrofitting dumpsters. And I think I pointed this out before, but the real uh, wonderful thing about this design is that these lids are secured within the little uh, barn door tracks that are on there. They don't, they don't flap around and bang around with all that extra weight that tweaks and breaks lids when they, when they get dumped by the trucks. So this door is secured and just does not move. And so it's a fantastic design. Uh, I've been really pushing and promoting all my, all my fellow bear people uh, east of the Mississippi knows about, <laughs> knows about this dumpster and this design now. Other cans, you know, I, I, this is the can that I have, the Bear Tight uh, can by Toter. Uh, this is the can that I have. I bought that at Lowe's and in, in here in Wise. Uh, it's been fantastic. Uh, let's see, that's a, the bear keg is top left. That's something like you're gonna hike the AT trail. That's a wonderful thing to carry all your, your food items, your toiletries and personal items in there. Bears cannot get into that. And then uh, Norton Reservoir, a couple years ago, uh, bought a bunch of enclosures. We helped them out. We provided them some funding, uh, but the campgrounds, the picnic areas, and the, the reservoir there all has these really nice enclosures to keep bears out and really look really look good too, keep the place clean. Uh, the critter getter, that's a, a noisemaker. I, I think we talked about last time. Really handy dandy uh, thing you can get on, on Amazon, I think 45, 50 bucks, and use a little D cell battery, those little square batteries. Uh, emits a really obnoxious, um, 
alarm and flashes little red lights like little beady eyeballs. Uh, so those are handy. I've got a couple of those that I loan out, uh, but highly recommend those for a lot of things. Um, raccoon. Seth, I think we lost your feed there somewhere along the way. He, he may be back up there now. I see him up there now. There we go. Can you hear me? Got him back. He's back. Yeah. Yes, sir. We can hear you. Okay. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened there. Let's go back to... I'm just about done, so... I don't know what happened there, but... Okay, um, so hopefully y'all can hear me, but this, I was saying these, these are some dumpsters behind Grundy High School that we put up some electric fencing and, and keeps bears out, worked great. Uh, and this is a public site with kids, you know, and you, you know, folks are usually kind of concerned about electric fencing and, and that, but I mean, I grew up with electric fencing. My papa said, hey, don't touch that, it'll shock you. And what did I do? I, I grabbed a hold of the fence and got shocked and just didn't do it anymore. And uh, it works great. And then I also ask people, you know, they're, they're concerned about student safety and, and children's safety from the bear, but not the electric fence. So, I, you know, but anyway, electric fence is great. There's nothing that you can't electrify. I found a um, good tool. Uh, but with that, if y'all have any uh, questions, I'm happy to, to answer questions. Great information, Seth. Uh, definitely good information. Uh, I think it's something that uh, in Kentucky or Virginia, I think it, uh, if you're in, uh, you know, where we're located at, uh, you know, Wisely, Harlan, Letcher, uh, any of those boarding, bordering counties, I think we're, uh, we're apt to see these. Uh, and it seems to be, uh, uh, I'm seeing a lot, uh, you know, more people talking about it that they're seeing more this year. So if you got any questions, uh, shoot them towards Seth. Yeah, I, I agree. It seems like in the last couple of weeks, there's been a big pulse in activity. And usually that, that tells me there's a big switch going on in the food sources. So I'm, I'm hoping that berries are looking good this year and there's plenty of those to keep bears occupied. But I had a friend, uh, he, he likes to bike uh, bicycle that is and he went um, he, he came up and over from Cumberland he came up and over uh, highway 160 down into Appalachian down and he saw nine bears between Cumberland and Appalachia mm. on Black Mountain so they're they're very active and moving around and they are. and we got a lot of bears they are definitely And like you mentioned, the uh, with the mass crop, uh, we're uh, still a little unsure on that. Uh, on some things, I know higher elevations uh, to hit uh, back in uh, late April. So, uh, or I guess early May. I guess it's early May, um, early to mid May. I guess it was. So it took a hit, uh, and you get into areas like uh, the top of Black Mountain, and then uh, over around the. Uh, Flag Rock High Knob in that area. Uh, I know there were uh, raspberry, uh, raspberry blackberry bushes that were just burnt to a turn over there. So, yeah, it it might be a, a busy fall. Yeah. Well, Seth, great information. Definitely, we appreciate you coming on. And if anybody has any questions, or now's the time to shoot them, shoot them toward. Towards Sayeth. 
Yes, I have a question on the hibernation. I was noticing all the different sites where they uh, choose to hibernate. Some of yes. them don't look all that um, out of the weather. Do they sometimes hibernate in areas where they're exposed to the weather, rain and so forth, or is it always a good dry site? Yeah, and it's, it's, um, it's variable among individuals and, and they do sometimes when, especially with the first big snow that we get of the year, a lot of times bears will, will do like a little day, like a little day bed kind of thing. They, they always will dig a day bed and, and sort of a shallow uh, thing to get down into the cool um, soil uh, year round. Uh, but especially when we, when we get a big snow like that, sometimes it'll catch them off guard and they'll kind of make up an impromptu kind of quick and dirty little thing to, uh, to just kind of hunker down. Uh, I remember I had a bear that I had collar. This was in Montana and it was a grizzly bear, but same kind of thing. I'd been trying to capture this bear and uh, I knew there was a big uh, hedgerow that he was, he was bedding down in, but we, he, it had gotten real quiet because we'd gotten like a foot of snow, like it, we just got dumped on. And I walked up the hedgerow and the snow was up through the, through the hedgerow. And all of a sudden I saw this, this mound of, of snow pick up <laughs> with these little ears. And he was just laying right in the middle, had a foot of snow on top of him. Um, but they do that sometimes when, it, when they really are gonna go and binge for reals they'll they'll typically find a, a lot more protected and covered up area especially if it's a female that has young or is is pregnant with young uh, she'll she'll find a, a place that's that's pretty protected but we've had bears uh den under people's decks <laughs> and people don't even know they're there you know um it's it's interesting Good question. Good answer. Awesome. Thank you for that question, Jerry. Good stuff. Anybody else? Yeah, this is interesting. I really enjoyed it. It's the, the bears are such a common sight anymore. And I, I clean up two or three bear messes every year here at my place. It's not my trash. It's my neighbor's trash. I get my neighbor's trash and bring it on my property and, and make the mess. <laughs> so uh, I'm getting good at it. Uh, <laughs> every bear mess takes less and less time to clean it up. I'm becoming efficient. <laughs> <laughs> Do have a question? But Dustin says I have heard that bear uh, are usually more aggressive once they came out, come out of hibernation. Is that true? Uh, I, I would say no. They're, they're typically a lot groggier. They have less energy to expend. And um, usually when bears first come out of hibernation or denning, I should say, they, they typically are really slow and lethargic. Um, and they, they tend to gravitate towards areas that are green, like the first kind of green up of the spring. Uh, to get grasses and sedges and things in them to kind of get their bodies going again. You know, they haven't eaten anything for months. So it'd kind of be like us going to the salad bar and getting some, some good roughage uh, going. And that's, that's really what they're looking for. And so really they, they're slow, they're groggy, they're not quite, their metabolism and their energy isn't quite up to what it, you know, what it would normally be. So they're a little slow uh, in the spring to get going. Your question. Anybody else? Thank you from Dustin. Thank you for the question, Dustin. Seth, you gave me some advice once that uh, we, we'd had a bear get into the chicken feed and also into the, some bird feeders. And I, I had the idea that I was going to uh, just put it out during the, during the daytime and take it in at night. And that's what we've been doing. And that's, that's so far work. But then you, you informed me that, like you said in your presentation, they can be active any time of the day. So, so, so still can't let my guard down, I guess, during the, during the daylight hours. Is that, that correct? Absolutely, especially as we get into the summer months and, and um, 
I had a call actually over the weekend. I went up to Grundy today because there was a bear that was just walking around during the daytime and um, getting into garbage. And, and, and like you, a lot of folks were just in the habit of just putting it up at night, you know, and weren't thinking about during the day and um, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Any, any other food source, dog food, especially uh, bears smell that and any time of day they can, they can come out and get into it. And, um, so yeah, I always, if you, you know, basically from April the 1st through December the 1st, if, if it's something that a bear could, would want to eat, uh, I'd, I'd sure be mindful of it where we live. All right. Okay. Thank you. Good information. Definitely. All right. Well, well, Seth, once again, thank you very much. And thank you for having me. Thank you. And uh, Jeremy, you can you mind telling them about the uh, what's happening tomorrow night? I can. Uh, tomorrow night we have uh, uh, we're going to have uh, forest health, and also we're actually going to be talking some about the mass crop, uh, hard mass. Uh, currently, uh, Dr. Ellen Crocker with the University of Kentucky uh, uh, Forestry uh, is going to be here uh, with us and uh, uh, she's going to uh, be talking about that. I do, I see, uh, I see a really good question here down here from Aaron. Uh, yeah. If I'm picking berries, should I drop my berries if I encounter a bear? Good question. Really good question. I'd say no. You, you put in the hard work to keep those. I'd, I'd, uh, I'd keep those with you. <laughs> <laughs> on, on, on something like that, on something like that, Seth. What's the best thing that you can do if you're out in the woods like that and you're uh, you're you're picking berries or, or hiking or whatever, and you you come up on a bear? What's the best thing you can do? Well, it depends, but in general, I would say just quietly back up and move out. If the bear is aware of you, just talk calmly to it and just back away slowly. Uh, don't make any sudden moves. Uh, don't continue towards the bear. Nine times out of 10, that bear is going to be gone long before you knew it was there. But if you do, you know, surprise a bear or run into a bear like that, um, again, most of the time it's going to turn and, and run and get away from you. But if it doesn't, you just want to talk to it and just slowly walk away. You never want to run. You never want to uh, do anything that would be, you know, perceived as threatening at all, unless, of course, the bear does come at you. At that case, you absolutely want to get loud and use whatever you have to defend yourself at that point. Um, but if you just see a bear and, you know, just a sudden encounter kind of thing, or if you're out, you know, picking berries and run into one or something, you know, it, it's probably going to turn and run, but just speak slowly and back away is all is the best thing you can do. Sneak a sardine into your buddy's pocket if possible. <laughs> right. What what is it? You're supposed to hike with people that you can outrun so you can yeah. just keep going. <laughs> good stuff. Good question. Good uh, good information. But yeah, uh forest or woodland health is tomorrow night, at six o'clock, uh right here. So uh we we'll look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow night and uh, uh Phil. Anything else? That's it. Thank Nothing. you all for tuning in. Yeah, definitely. And Seth, thank you again. Good to see you again. You too. Thanks for having me, guys. Take care. Right, thank you. Very good. Everybody have a great evening. We'll see you tomorrow night.